10 tools, walking and where it leads, walking off my anger. The summer after my junior year in high school, I got my first job at the local hospital. Left alone in a room with a typewriter, a table, a chair, and a big round clock on the wall, I was to retype a thick nursing manual eight hours a day, five days a week. Each morning I would buy two packs of gum in the hospital gift shop. When the minute hand on the clock stuck 12, I would stop, unwrap a new stick of gum, and pop it in my mouth. Gum was both my way of keeping time and a reward for enduring another hour of tedium. At 10.15 a.m. and 2.30 p.m., I would go to the basement cafeteria for my 15-minute break, and at noon for lunch. Everybody sat around listlessly smoking and drinking coffee. They talked about what they wanted to do for vacation or how they were too tired to go on one. We all hated Mondays and waited for TGIF. By the end of eight hours, my natural energy was so bottled up that I was furious. Is this what adults do? Is this what it means to be an adult? I vowed then and there that I would never live like that. Never spend my life working at something I hated, waiting for time off. As I look back on this, I'm amazed at the strength of my silent assessment of adult life and my determination to live differently. The passion of this stance didn't seem in character with my otherwise obedient personality. Being preoccupied with death, I was not much given to thinking about life or how to live it. I kept my vow. Not once since that time have I been a full-time wage slave, trading my valuable time, talent, and energy just for money. People think I'm lucky. They don't realize that my feeling of repulsion at this kind of death in life was so strong as a 16-year-old that it set me on a different course altogether. That summer after work, I would walk the two miles home, burning off steam, burning off my fury at thinking about what it meant to become an adult. By the time I got home, I felt better. And what is unusual here, I was consciously aware that walking home from work made me feel better. From then on, walking became something I did whenever I wanted to feel better. No matter what the problem was, walking would help me iron it out. I am 54 years old now, and since I was 16, I have walked between three and five miles each day. No matter what the weather, no matter what my schedule, walking is a priority. During my 20 years as a professional astrologer, I would ask depressed clients about their exercise patterns and advocate walking. I would tell them, walking is my shrink. They would laugh. But I'm serious, I would say. Because I walk almost every single day, my energy does not get stuck. Like an increasing number of holistic thinkers and practitioners, I see most disease patterns as originating in stagnant energy, where the original flow among body, mind, and spirit becomes distorted or shut off. A part of the self begins to separate out. In my case, it was my anger, which had no outlet, and sucks energy from the whole. This energy drain is then experienced as lassitude, boredom, and ultimately, depression. Boredom is a signal that something needs to change. And yet when one is depressed, it takes extra effort to make that change. The more stuck the energy, the more does it have a tendency to remain stuck, and vice versa. The more we move, the greater our tendency to remain in motion. In order to break the spell of the stuckness, there has to be strong internal or external motivation. Luckily, I noticed how walking helped and so became internally motivated to help myself feel better by walking. That is how I discovered that walking was therapeutic. I don't think that anyone who briskly walks at least a few miles on a daily basis can become seriously depressed. Walking intensifies breathing. Deep breathing oxygenates and energizes the tissues of the entire body-mind. A good workout on a daily basis is the best kind of medical insurance. Walking and self-remembering. 
As a college freshman at Dominican College in San Rafael, California, I began to walk the lovely winding roads on weekends in the beautiful wooded Marin Hills. The sun dappling through eucalyptus trees and spreading oaks warmed my heart. The intense lime green of spring grasses and leaves excited me like a lover. I treasured those walks. They were something I conceived and executed alone. They were entirely mine, as my life was mine. I was away from home, on my own, feeling excited and expectant. Moving through space expanded my view of time. What lay ahead? What could I look forward to? I loved to watch the campus below receding as I gained more height and distance. Finding my dorm window from the hilltop, I would mentally project myself back there in that room, obsessively underlying Augustine's confessions or longing for my high school boyfriend. He was thousands of miles away at Yale and be amazed at how petty my usual concerns seemed from the top of the hill. Years later, when embroiled in some particularly sticky emotional stuff, I learned to project myself mentally to the top of a mountain or a cloud in order to get distance on things, and I counseled others to do the same. In this way, I began to be aware of two points of view simultaneously. I was both in the situation and not of it, both participating fully in experience while also objectively seeing myself there as an impartial witness. The Russian mathematician Uspensky following the philosopher Gurdjieff, called this self-remembering. Wherever you are in your life, whatever you are doing, I recall Uspensky saying in one of his books, stop, just stop. Notice, notice yourself. Notice what you're doing. Notice that it is you who is doing it. Most people are mechanical, he said, by which he meant that they are reactive. It is as if they are being pulled on strings from the outside, like automata, and have no inner core from which to move. He advocated self-remembering as a powerful technique for building an authentic inner core. I read this when I was 27 years old, fresh out of my first marriage, a situation which I had endured without love for more than six years. I was excited to be alive and yet feeling utterly incapable of responding to life. Uspensky's books became one of many lifelines helping to bridge the gap which those six years had created between my personality for others and whatever it was that lay underneath. I knew something did. I was determined to find out. I began to practice self-remembering on my daily walks through the cobbled streets of Cambridge, Massachusetts, bumping along the bricked surfaces with my little boys, one sitting in the stroller, one standing on the ledge behind. Aha, there you are. You are you, I would say internally, as I noticed myself gripping the smooth metal handle or stepping with my left foot, then my right. You are you, as I noted the color of the stoplight or listened to my child's question. Despite having two small children, I continued my practice of daily walking. Sean and Colin had been bundled inside the old buggy from the time each was one week old, walking, walking, up one street and down the other, every day, rain or shine, snow or sleet. Nothing stopped us from getting out. The alternative would have been battering, child abuse. By this time, I was so furious and so frustrated in life that I was screaming continuously on the inside, and there were times I turned on our small cat, throwing it against the wall. I knew that if it were not the cat, it would be the children. Walking took the edge off, but it didn't solve the problem. Years before, I had figured out that I didn't want to work as a slave for money. Now I was recognizing that as a wife and mother, I was working as a slave for no money. So while I call walking a tool for transformation, during those years in my early 20s, I walked to survive. Walking helped me to live through that time and inflict a minimum of damage to both myself and others. Walking and smiling. I discovered something else while walking with the children in Cambridge, which over time would actually teach me how to thrive. I remember the moment clearly. I was striding briskly along, as usual, and happened to pass a tiny, frail old woman tottering carefully on the sidewalk with her cane. I slowed down in order not to scare her, 
and then smiled to reassure her that I would not knock her down. The old woman looked startled at my smile and then smiled back. Her smile was like the sun breaking through clouds after a long period of rain. It warmed me inside. Then I noticed that her smile made me feel warm inside, that in smiling we were connecting, no matter how brief. Our connection lifted my mood from what had become an increasingly morbid introspection. From what had become an increasingly morbid introspection. From then on, I made it a point to look in the eyes of those I passed on the street and smile. One day, striding along by myself, I noticed that my fingers were typing into the air in a certain sequence over and over again. I focused on what they were saying. I, middle finger on right hand, am, little finger on left hand, followed by index finger on right hand, a, uh, little finger on left hand, mess, index finger on right hand, middle finger on left hand, ring finger on left hand, twice. I am a mess. I am a mess. I had no idea that I'd been typing that phrase into the air. As the days went on, I noticed how often my fingers went automatically into that typing sequence when I was walking and wondered for how long they had been doing so. This was my introduction to the ways of self-sabotage, though it would be many years before I could really focus on it. So while I was learning how to smile consciously, thus lifting my mood at will, as well as connecting with others, I was also riddled with unconscious undercurrents which were continuously undermining me. Contemplating my life. When I was 30 years old, I found myself in Marin again, this time as a teacher in an experimental college. It had been 12 years since I had last walked there. The hills were the same, the trees and grasses and breathtaking views in green were the same, and yet I was different. I had real experience under my belt now, and that had changed me. How, I wondered. What does it mean to have lived through something? One year later, right before school began in September, I was abruptly fired from my position. They told me I was too experimental for that experimental college. I have only dim recall of the terrible months that followed. I do know that each day I dragged myself out to walk, shivering in the cold fog and rain. The fog outside reflected my inner condition. On the one hand, being fired had shocked me into numbness. On the other hand, I knew that if I was to go forward, I had to make sense of what had happened. Now I really had my life to contemplate. Here I was, 30 years old, and my budding career as a college teacher was over. What regular college would have me when an experimental college had fired me? During this time, I was also introduced in a very real way to the idea of relativity and perception. The same hills I had walked both when I was 18, then at 29, and now at 30 looked entirely different. The vistas which seemed to open up to infinity when very young had turned gray and sodden. Looking into the woods, I no longer saw sunlight dappling leaves. I saw the tangled chaos of my own confusion. After a few months, I moved to Mendocino County, seeking refuge in walking the cliffs above the ocean and in the mysterious whispers of ancient forests. As usual, I walked miles each day. The fresh humiliation of my firing gradually began to fade. Or, I realize now, it sunk down into the unconscious, only to awaken with a start years later. Dream comes true. After another six months, I moved again, back to my old hometown in Idaho, to marry my high school boyfriend. Like in a fairy tale, finally, after 12 long years of being apart, during which we had each endured difficult marriages to others, we came together. Our dream had come true. Each day I walked around a square mile of farmland on the edge of town, on the same roads where I had once galloped my horse as a young girl. I felt free then, free as a bird. Now, despite tearful happiness in my emotional reunion with Dick, I longed to gallop again. Each day, walking that first mile, I would feel unaccountably low, confused. Why am I so frustrated when I'm so happy finally getting together with my true love? What am I doing here in my hometown? Why am I on this planet? 
Who am I? Then, hips and thighs opening to the future, I would feel the rush of energy as I hit my stride. As I had as a child, once again I was awestruck by my own smallness in the vastness of desert sky. The world was utterly open-ended, infinite. Yet I was walking an exact, straight, four-square grid, caught like a bird in a cage. I told my new husband I felt like a bird which had landed on his branches to rest. Two years later, with his reluctant permission, I flew off. Walking in the Tetons. Now, living in the mountains of western Wyoming, I take my pick of literally hundreds of places to walk every day. In early morning or late afternoon of summer and fall, I walk along the Grovant River near my home in Kelly. When working in Jackson, I walk up a trail into Cache Creek Canyon just outside town, or I hike to the top of Snow King Mountain. On weekends, I might hike trails in the Tetons or walk the road to the Warm Springs, two miles north of Kelly. In winter, I cross-country ski, a particularly aerobic form of walking. When I first moved here 14 years ago, my lungs weren't as strong as they are now. It feels as if I have more energy for walking every year I'm here, and yet, as usual, the walks continue to mutate in their meaning. The energy of the Tetons is intense, crystalline, electromagnetic. Many people speak of how they were forced into confronting their stuff when they moved here, that these mountains wouldn't let them do anything else. The same is true for me. When I moved to Jackson, I was a peace activist, networking the tri-state area of Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana for a publication for peace activists, which I had begun with another woman during the years when Reagan was calling the MX missile Peacekeeper and the Soviet Union the Evil Empire. My walks, like my whole life during those days, were more like forced marches. I had a job to do. I had to save the world, and nobody was buying it. No matter how forcefully I argued against the 50,000 nuclear missiles the U.S. had pointed against others, nobody seemed to be listening. Time after time, as I spoke to small groups, I would watch their eyes glaze over. The further they receded from my speech, the more furious I became. What was wrong with these people? Don't they know that the world is about to blow up? My secret preoccupation of childhood was now front and center and had been ever since I read Jonathan Schell's moving series Fate of the Earth in The New Yorker in December 1981. Schell broke the conspiracy of silence which I had experienced for 40 years. Finally, it was time. Time to speak the unspeakable. Time to turn the tide before it was too late. And nobody was listening. The difficulty I had in holding people's attention in my public lectures was compounded by near-constant quarreling among the staff who worked on the magazine, as well as turf battles between us and other activist organizations. I raged at the hypocrisy between our message of peace and our own petty little wars. At some point, the truth dawned on me. I was a violent peace activist. I, who was so determined to create peace, had been fighting the whole world. The horror of that recognition was shocking and absolute. I immediately stopped my involvement in the publication I had founded and moved from the town of Jackson to a small yurt in a compound within the village of Kelly, directly across the valley from the Grand Teton itself. For four months in the winter of 1983-84, I sat in front of the firebox and stared into the fire, contemplating my life, seeing the violence in it, all the way through, racked by guilt over my own part in the warlike atmosphere which prevails, I began to investigate my life, to dismantle the conditioning which had created violence within me. I wanted to go back to the beginning, to leave no stone unturned, to start over again. I thought this investigation would take a year or two. Ha! My probe into the origins of the wars within my own psyche took seven years. For those seven years, I was preoccupied with my own inner life, what had formed me. Though I was working as an astrologer, and though I had plenty of friends and good times, my main work was on this inner level, and I spent upwards of eight hours a day sifting through memory, tracking the causes of war within myself. Walking 
and breathing. One of the main techniques for healing during those years was a certain type of breathing I would do during daily walks. Early on in this process, I was struck by the differential between the exquisite natural beauty of my environment and how awful I felt inside. Outside of me was this glorious world, and inside was hell. Gradually, I learned to consciously breathe in that glory, that wonderfully pure mountain air, and, and to just as consciously breathe out what felt like noxious gases seeping from a black, tarry mass inside my solar plexus. The sense of awfulness was so great that it felt like a huge, heavy stone was lodged inside my stomach. I literally couldn't stomach it anymore. Whatever it was, it was indigestible. I had to get rid of it. How? By breathing. For several years during those terrible times, every day when I went out for my walk, I would begin this pattern of conscious breathing. Breathing in the beauty and loveliness and purity of the natural world and breathing out the ugliness and the blackness inside. During this period, I would walk until the in-breath felt equal in quality to the out-breath, until the awful stuff inside that day had been released and my breathing returned to a state of equilibrium. I found this technique to be of enormous benefit in my work of releasing the toxic matter inside which had been buried all those years and which, during my early and middle 40s, was bubbling to the surface with a vengeance. It meant that each day during my walks, simply by breathing with conscious intent, take in the clarity, let go of chaos, I could release a tiny piece of what had held me prisoner of hatred and anger for so long. Toward the end of those seven years, I found myself in relationship with a man who was emotionally tied to his ex-wife. Every three weeks, he would drive seven hours to visit his children and sleep in the same bed with his wife, his ex-wife, for the sake of the family, he would vow. We don't do anything. So every three weeks on schedule, I felt abandoned. And of course, he spent holidays with them. During this time, I had proudly considered walking to be my daily meditation, the hour or two when I could get away from it all and return refreshed. What I was actually doing was using my daily walks to obsess about my triangle with this man and his ex-wife. I was hating them both and constantly thinking about their relationship. In my imagination, I would move them like pawns in my own game into a different kind of relationship so I could have him to myself. It was quite a shock when I woke up to this fact one day. While out walking on the road in the National Elk Refuge near Jackson, all of a sudden I realized that I was oblivious to my surroundings. I hadn't noticed the earth, the air, the ravens, the muddy potholes, the elk in the distance. I was marching like a soldier, fast, furious, the whole time seeing the figures I had projected out in front of me. They were the objects of my wrath, and I was moving them this way and that, like marionettes. Instead of walking to clear my brain, I was obsessing every step of the way. That Thanksgiving, as usual, I spent alone, filled with dark visions of him contentedly eating turkey with his ex-family. Feeling particularly sorry for myself, I decided to walk a greater distance that day. I would go to a place I'd never walked, in hopes of changing my mood. The plan worked. I found myself going up a small mountain which I had never climbed before, following the scat and tracks of mountain sheep. The Tetons shimmered in the distance, and the higher I went, the more the scales seemed to fall from my eyes. I was feeling light and strong and free. It was as if I had broken a spell. The years of continuous rejection had made me feel as if I had no value as a human being. Now, walking up the mountain, I said to myself, he should be grateful to have me in his life. And then, realizing he did not, turn the tables. My God, then he doesn't deserve me. I'm worth more than that. That walk was the beginning of a shift. At first it seemed to come and go, and there were times I would backtrack. My challenge was to integrate the insights of the peak with the dailiness of the valley. The following week, walking in town, I again found myself obsessing. This time I was self-remembering so successfully that I actually saw my obsessing in much closer, more analytic terms. I realized that by continuously thinking about these two people, I was ignoring the way I was feeling. 
Furthermore, I realized that in order to let go of the obsession with them, I would have to get into this feeling and honor it, embrace it. That I would have to take back the projection and move the charge that it carried down into my body to the place where the pain was located. I knew where it would be located even before I could feel it, in my solar plexus and heart area, as usual. From that day on, I used my walks to practice breaking the addiction to my obsession with this man and his ex-wife. As soon as I noticed myself thinking about them, I would remember myself and stop and take back the thought and move the charge that it carried down into my body, directly into the pain. This was an extraordinarily difficult thing to do. My entire body-mind system was so accustomed to dealing with pain by rushing out of the body and into the mind, and from there into certain thoughts which would then be immediately projected into what I thought was the outside world, that I never realized that the origin of the thought was the pain. I had hit upon an aspect of how my body-mind had been hardwired. I was now probing the foundation of how my entire way of life was set up to work. Only slightly less difficult was moving that slippery charge down into my body into the pain, the hard, stony mass that I felt in my solar plexus area. On the one hand, I had to keep the charge from immediately cathecting back out into the world into the form of judgments against this man and his ex-wife. And on the other hand, I had to move it down into my own body and keep it there. If I succeeded in that, then while still walking, I would breathe in and out deeply into the solar plexus. At first, it was as if the stony mass would not accept the breath, so dense was the pain, so concentrated. And at first, I could only focus on the pain momentarily, without the charge shooting back up into the mind, its projections. Gradually, as the days went by, I found myself able to let go of the thought and move into the feeling more and more easily. The hard stone in my chest and stomach began to accept the breath, the carrier of light energy, and to expand and become less dense. The finale to this drama of letting go was a dream, which I will tell in the chapter on dreams. What I want to emphasize here is just how difficult, how subtle, and how profound this change was, this task that I set for myself on my daily walks. Who would have known, seeing a woman striding down the road, that she was performing miracles on herself? Walking on the Earth One day in early summer, I walked up to the top of Shadow Mountain, directly across from the Tetons, and lay down in a luxurious green meadow splashed with the bloom of yellow dock. A long, rainy spring had brought the earth to life and made me hunger for the sun. After a while, I removed my clothes. Lying there naked in the sun's warmth, I felt drowsy, sensuous, tickled by the breeze, by little sprigs of sage and grass. Closing my eyes, I drifted to the murmuring of ravens courting in the trees. Slowly, languorously, I opened into a sensation of love and gratitude so overwhelming that I turned on my stomach and made love to the earth. It feels as if I now have a contract with the natural world. Earth will give me her beauty, and I will give her my love. Like many others, I feel the earth's sorrow at her abandonment by the human race and wish to return to her something of what she so constantly and faithfully gives me. My conscious breathing of before has been joined with conscious seeing. As I gaze out over the extraordinary land which I am so fortunate to live within, I consciously express love for what peace activist physician Helen Caldicott first called this beautiful earth. I allow my eyes to go soft, consciously filling them with love, caressing the river to my left, the sage and prairie grasses underfoot, the clump of shimmering aspens to my right, the wheeling hawk, the clouds and sun and wind overhead. As often as possible, I walk by rivers, and this year especially I've been fascinated by the changes a river undergoes as it rises and falls with spring runoff. The Grovant River near my home moved its channel entirely this year, gouging out its western banks to bedrock. There are now huge new gravel islands in the middle of the river. Uprooted trees from the torrents a few months ago lie on their sides, 
havens for birds and other small life. I walk and I walk and I walk again, noticing my breath, noticing my vision, walking, thanking my lover, Earth. May we all walk in such beauty.